Thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor. It's been a little quiet lately. I, I, had a, I had a conference this weekend, University of Rochester. It went super well. I even managed to talk a little bit about my videos that I did on Taylor Swift and Tyler the Creator. Uh, but here I'm to talk to you about the new album from Jane Remover, Census Designated. Now, I almost reviewed her last album, uh, which was called Frailty, uh, but she had a different name back then. It was Dizzletick. Dil Dil Tizic. Dizzle? Mixelplexix. D I don't know. I never, I never knew. I, I never knew how to pronounce that name. I don't know if that's why I <laughs> didn't review it, uh, but it might have been. And to tell you the truth, I actually kind of regret not reviewing it. I listened to it since, and it really was good, and I should have covered it. Nevertheless, here she is, and she's out with a new album. And it's maybe good that I didn't review that, because uh, in that time, uh, she has come out as, as trans and transitioned. So I don't even know if a musician's name from when... Yeah, a musician's pseudonym from before they transitioned is not a dead name. So, I don't know. That's like a legitimate question, and I don't even have the answer to that. So it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, what, what does matter is that it's a very good album. It's a very unexpected album. Based on what I heard from Frailty, I was not expecting this kind of rock album. I'll talk more about genres in a little bit. And the question is this, and I've been, I've been sort of buzzing around this question, talking about this question for the last... How long have I done this channel? Six years? Is there such a thing as trans music? Like, is there now... Okay, so, so the main thing to understand is that this attempt to identify or, or to designate is done reluctantly, right? Like, I think it's important to, to recognize similarities, to recognize traits, to recognize that there is a moment that's happening now, that there are now essentially for the first time in popular culture, highly visible, multiple highly visible artists creating who are trans. Obviously they have existed in the past, but I'm talking about visibility, cultural acceptance, cultural discussion. Maybe acceptance isn't the right term, but cultural discussion. I've said many times that when I was growing up, it wasn't even a discussion. So, okay, so, so we're in this moment and it's great because we have all of these people who manage to express themselves, express their worldview, everything that an artist does in this moment where this heightened visibility and this heightened discussion is happening. So I have this vague idea, <laughs> perhaps it's an arrogant idea, that these videos could be important. So I'm going to, I'm actually, I'm going to make a, a playlist of all, all my videos that, that talk about trans artists, including, including one who I reviewed before they transitioned. So I apologize to Patricia Taxon uh, for dead naming her before she changed, but I couldn't predict the future. Uh, because I, I think that in my continued effort to be a middle-aged cishet white dude who was a transphobe for much of his life, right, which I've admitted on other videos, uh, that now that I've understood and I've evolved and I've grown, uh, that perhaps my perspective, uh, if we have all these videos together in sort of a playlist, <laughs> that maybe in the future people can look back and say, hey, this was the beginning or at least the, the rise of the trans music artist. So what I've come up with is not great. It's okay. You know, it's one of my least favorite things when you go to an academic conference is when people start off by saying, this is just a rough draft, but here we go. But it necessarily is a rough draft because this art is in creation, right? It's not over. These are the general themes that I've come up with that they are, and I'm going to be applying these to Drain Remover's album. A very of the moment. Obviously, we are living in this moment of trans awareness and trans awakening usually hyper-pop or some kind of super-fractured musical landscape. By super-fractured, I mean playing with rhythms, playing with sounds falling apart, playing with digit digitization, playing with distortion, usually electronic. Often the lyrics are focused on identity, frequent reminders of gender and or sex and or sexuality, a lot of focus on the body with some amount of body horror. But that's what I've come up with. But I mean, seriously, you know, just this month or whatever, just these last couple months, 
Now, I've reviewed these two artists, Lauren O'Day, uh, Lauren Auder, I don't know how we pronounce her name, uh, and Underscores. And these albums aren't the same. These are, these are as different as, you know, Paul Simon and Black Sabbath. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, yeah, it's all great music. These are two of the best albums of the year. Uh, but it's be way too simplistic. Way too simplistic just to say that there is a trans music. So I'm simultaneously putting forth that as an idea while also seeking to constantly undercut my own theory. And if you are like me and you are interested in this question and you want to leave comments, please leave comments. If you are offended by the fact that a cishet straight white dude is having this discussion at all, put that in the comments as well, okay? I'm, I'm not afraid of criticism. I am skeptical about my own ability or because I don't have any authority, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tourist, right? I'm, this is not my life. This is not what I'm living through. I'm just trying to observe the culture. I'm trying to observe the cultural products uh, that I'm hearing. The same way that I would write about 17th century French literature is the way I write about other people's lived experience, right? That's what's happening here. So let's kind of go through that, that playlist and, and see, I mean, through that, uh, that checklist and see how does Jane Remover fit into this, let's call it, half-assed attempt to define something of trans music in the late teens and early 2020s. Very of the moment. Well, yes. Hyperpop. No, not at all. Fractured? At times. At times there's some fractured sounds, uh, there's some distortion, there's some loud buzzing and beeping. But what I find really interesting about this album, uh, six minutes in, I apologize to all you Jane Remover fans hoping for me to actually talk about the music. <laughs> I swear I will. That's why my videos are so long, because uh, I want to give some space to, to contextualize these things. Uh, I don't give grades, you know. Uh, but when you look at the Bandcamp genres, I don't think any of them really work. Alternative rock. So if you go on Bandcamp and look up this album by Jane Remover, the which, by the way, like top five band names like right now, Jane Remover is such a good name. It's so like powerful. Like the simplicity of Jane and the simplicity of the name Remover, but at the same time, like there's a, a sense of loss, a sense of menace, like ah jeez, it's a great name. Anyways, you you look you look up this album and it says it's alternative rock, electronic, indie rock, pop, post rock, shoegaze, singer songwriter, Chicago. Now, that last one doesn't make any sense at all. Saturday in the park. I think it was the 4th of July. It doesn't sound anything like Chicago. No horns or anything. So that one we'll just discard. And shoegaze works. And of course, singer-songwriter works because she is a singer-songwriter. But I would actually add something else that's not there. To me, as a child of the 1990s. Sorry, there's a very aggressive plant over here. See how aggressive that plant is? So if I gesticulate too wildly, that's Perry. That's Perry, the bird of paradise. So I apologize for when I hit Perry. Um, the genre that I actually hear is grunge. And that might seem like bizarre, but let's look up the Wikipedia definition of grunge. Fuses elements of punk rock and heavy metal, but without punk structure and speed. The genre features or featured distorted electric guitar sound. Some bands performed with more emphasis than the other. Electric guitar, bass guitar, drums, and vocals incorporates influences from indie rock. Lyrically, lyrics are typically angst-filled and introspective, often addressing themes such as so social alienation, self-doubt, abuse, neglect, betrayal, social and emotional isolation, addiction, psychological trauma, and the desire for freedom. I hear a lot of that in here. So that's the way that I think of it. Now, I don't know what I'm going to title this video. I don't think I'm going to say Jane Remover is the new face of grunge. But I think you could make a real argument that what grunge did for me when I was 15 or 16 or 14 years old, okay? Like what that did for me to be a, a sort of oddly positive voice of negativity, you know, some kind of like dark... <laughs> dark source of light, if that makes sense. Uh, that's what a lot of great, a lot of great sad music is. It's a dark source of light. I can imagine this album being a dark source of light for people a third or a half of my age. 
okay? Four teenagers. That's what I picture. I picture this having that same feeling and a kind of feeling that doesn't come with bleeps and bloops. I love bleeps and bloops. Shout out to my bleeps and bloops peoples. But actually playing guitar, actually playing drums, and actually playing bass, there's nothing that can replace that in terms of visceral power of music. And that appears to me, appears to me what Jane Remover is trying to do here. She is trying to get that power that comes from those instruments and away from bleeps and bloops. So maybe, maybe the great thing would be if there was no trans music. Like the great thing would be if there was no alterity at all. I mean, we're not there yet, you know, but the great thing would be if it was just normal, just that's what it is. Just every human, trans rights are human rights, trans people are human people, and then that's just it. And then there's no need for any distinction. But obviously given the, the oppression and the rejection and the laws and the fall of terrible uh, young adult authors who we used to treat as a hero, um, that's just not going to happen, right? <laughs> we're, we're not at the point yet where we are post-trans issues there's still not acceptance. So that's what we want though, right? What we want is the boringness of acceptance, which is maybe where actually Kim Petras fits in because she is just so, such a, just a pop star, you know, that, that whole other aspect. Anyways, so whether, are there issues of identity in this album? Sort of going down my, my trans music checklist. Not really. Uh, I mean, there's a lot about putting on a false face but it feels much more personal. It feels like it's putting on a false face for a person, not for society. Essentially, this album, as, as I read it, and we'll talk about why Jane Remover probably doesn't even want me to be reading her album unless I know, so we'll talk about that in a second. But it's mostly what appears to me to be abstract portraits of dysfunctional and maybe abusive relationships. Sort of right on that line. Like, this kind of ties into the question of, you know, is this about the body? It doesn't feel. Is there body horror? Not really. But it's sort of like non-graphic, pornographic lyrics. You know, there's lots of, like, spitting and swallowing and mouths and implied body fluids. Next to that is a lot of sort of rotten tastes and cuts and stains. Again, sort of in that kind of grungy area as well. But it all seems to be that she appears to be singing, and I don't know if it's first person or third person. You know, it's hard to tell if she's narrating her own life or if she's imagining lies, but it seems to be primarily about a predator-prey relationship in which the girl, usually sung in the first person, is exploited but is amb ambivalent about the exploitation, that she's acknowledging that some part of her wants that, and I would go one step further and say it's outlining how the better part of her understands that she shouldn't want it. So she's aware of her exploitation. Uh, she is deriving some kind of sad, um, damaged pleasure from that exploitation while also starting to turn against the exploitation. And, and just naming it and showing it is a fight against that exploitation. So that's how I read it. But do you know what Jane Remover says? <laughs> and this comes from Genius. Uh, actually, at the conference, uh, is a friend of mine who was friends with uh, Mabad, the, the guy who started uh, Rap Genius. She told me about it all like, like 15 years ago, whatever, 10 years ago. She's like, my friend is starting a, a rap lyric site. I was like, cool. <clears throat> Anyways, on Genius, Jane Remover says... Unless I state otherwise, stop annotating on my songs. If you are unsure what the lines are about, please stop making assumptions. So with that, I give you my caveat that everything I'm saying is, as our colleagues across the ocean would say, utter bollocks. Okay? These are all just <clears throat> suppositions, theories, game theories, just talking. Okay? So please, please don't think that I... I don't even think I'm right on this. This is just my reading. 
it's funny because as I'm as I'm kind of piecing together this concept of is there such a thing as trans music, uh, <laughs> I was thinking how Ethel Kane doesn't quite fit into my own vision of this, and this is good. What I want is to be wrong, right? Like I want, well, it's not that I want to be wrong, but I want the I want the I want to move towards, like I said, a sort of invisible trans music where it's there's no alterity implied, right? No otherness implied. But the cover is Jane Remover standing in front of like an abandoned barn. And this made me think of two things. One, I used to have these Canadian friends who were like, hey, how come there's so many broken down houses in America? I, I don't, I never really thought about that, but it's true. Like they're all over the place. What's going on there? And the other thing was, it just, it reminded me of the kind of rustic aesthetic of Ethel Kane's uh, last album. And it turns out, based on something that I read, this was intentional. So, hey, I'm not wrong on that. Before I actually get to the album, I also want to say something about the record label, Dead Air. So, you know, they, they did this, and they did Quadica, and I get the sense, just by this level of curation, that, that they might be onto something, like, really good. Like, this is, I'm going too far here, but... But you know, part of what made the 90s so powerful was these like underground labels that curated and found a lot of great art that helped to represent the time, right? The spirit of the time, the zeitgeist. As my friends in Germany would say, the zeitgeist. You know, in Boston, you had Tang Records, but much bigger, you had Sub Pop in Seattle. And I think there's a chance the dead air could end up being a kind of Sub Pop for today's youth just with their uh, selection, their roster of artists, and their ability to sort of like, like connect. Because the thing about like, like the always online kids, Gen Z, go to death grip shows wearing beanie hats, like that's, that's true, I get it, but I'm not that old. Like there's, there's, there's always stupid youth and there's always like hurt, vulnerable, smart youth. And Sub Pop hit that, that that vulnerable, smart, hurting youth. And it feels to me like Dead Air is doing that. So anyways, props to them. Uh, before I get to my stamp, if you like this video and you put in the letters A-V-A-A, -A -A, I will give a heart on that comment. That's like my little way of, because I read all my comments, but I didn't know how to like tell you that I read them all. So that's what I do. Uh, you can smash the like bucket. You can subscribe. I want to get to 100,000 subscribers so I can have a plaque for my ego. Uh, and you can go to my Patreon if you wish as well. So, I, it's actually because of Patreon that I was able to support these two artists, okay? I took their money from my PayPal and I bought these two albums, okay? Do you know how good that feels? Do you know how cool that is? That like people help me and then I'm able to buy art? Because that's what this channel's about. All right, let's get to the stamp, which happens to be the first song. Uh, click above the banana above the picture of David Ortiz. <clears throat> Spoiler. Cage Girl, Cam Girl. Musically, I love this song. It's got these winding up sounds. It's cool because the album ends with a wind down. It starts with a wind up, some grumbling sounds underneath, even like a little voice. It's kind of a slow and low intro. It gets sort of epic and mournful. And it's got that really low, like kind of detuned guitar, plodding low notes. And that's where I thought of grunge. Like just immediately, it's the first thing that hit me was like grunge, you know? Just like, like, like you know when you like uh, go into a rest, you, know, you go into a mall and you open up the door and the smell of like Cinnabons just hits you across the face. It had that kind of feeling, just like, I was just like, hey, it's the 90s. But then there's these nice little delicate guitar lines over top that lighten everything up a little bit. They're kind of catchy. There's kind of these little two notes, down which happen all, you know, all over the place. Uh, this doubled voice, very sort of weird lyrics, which I'll talk about right now. Cam Girl, Cage Girl. So I've been discussing the themes of this album, which appear to me, and again, apologies to Jane Remover, I'm making assumptions, I, but I'm not annotating, okay? I'm not going on genius and saying, this is what this is about, okay? So I'll stop apologizing now. Uh, <laughs> but it's interesting because Cage Girls and Cam Girls. So Cage Girls, I assume, like references like 
go-go girls who like dance, like cage dancers, which is a thing that happens in some clubs and some strip clubs. And cam girls obviously applies to girls who, uh, or young women, hopefully, uh, or old women, or any women, hopefully not girls, who film themselves and make money by people giving them money for taking off their shoes or cutting their toenails. I don't know what. That's way after my time. But what's interesting is <laughs> the cage girl is a very old-fashioned image. And then the cam girl is a very new fashion image. But the common denominator is they are girls who are trapped for the sexual pleasure of mostly men. So that's a, that's a just right off the bat, just the, there's a real, it's going back to that, that general idea of the kinds of abuse that girls and women suffer. And there's a sort of universality of it just with this title. Her lyrics are great because they're hard to pin down. I bite down and bite hard, wake up at the crack of dawn. Don't notice, you must have been over your head. Chew me up, spit you out before you can swallow. I peel my eyes open. Everyone knows and nobody cares. Like you sort of get the sense it feels lost. It feels desperate. It feels mm, degraded. Like chew me up and spit me out before you can swallow. And then this next line, I know it's you because I know how it feels when your hand's in my hair. This is what I'm talking about, this sort of non-graphic, pornographic element of this album. Because you know, when do men have their hands on women's hair? Well, it's not always forcibly making reference to any kind of sexual act, but it hints at it. And it's great because the whole song builds up with all these great layers, some guitar distortion before the next verse. And then we just get this line. I'm starving in your house, shoveling fake deep lines from that guy you like. I hate him so much that I want to kill him, but I let it slide this time. And all my life I've been waiting for my new limbs to come in. Now here's that interesting aspect of, and this is a theme that, that pops up, that's been popping up in multiple albums by trans artists and I don't think this is a copy, right? I think there must be something, and dear God, if you are trans, tell me that I'm a, a total idiot and I'm totally wrong, or say, hey, that's cool that you understood that. Um, the sense of a new limb coming in, this has been something that you sort of sense where the body like adds and loses elements, and that's sort of an aspect to being trans in that body modification. There's There's something there to the amount of sort of reformulation of the human body. I open my mouth as wide as I can, hot in my face. A hey. <laughs> Non-graphic, a uh, pornographic. That's why I read it. Then we get to the line, you're biting chunks out of my face, which reminded me very strongly of a very shocking scene from Martin Scorsese's 1991 film, Cape Fear. Starring Robert De Niro, who was having an amorous relationship with the actress Ileana Douglas. Uh, and while he was having coitus with her, he reached down and bit off a huge chunk of her cheek. Now, I don't know if that's what, what, uh, what Jane Remover was thinking of, but it also reminds me of a 1991 album put out by a little group from Seattle called Nirvana. If you think of the song Drain You, just... just, just Listen to what I'm saying here. Like, I'm going to read you the lyrics from Drain You, some lyrics, and see how much they fit in this atmosphere, in this world that Jane Remover is giving us. It is now my duty to completely drain you. I travel through a tube and end up in your infection. Chew your meat for you, pass it back and forth in a passionate kiss from my mouth to yours. That, that kind of degradation and consumption that cannibalistic feeling, like the, the, the equation of cannibalism and love, is very much in Nirvana and is very much in the song Cam Girl, Cage Girl, Cage Girl, Cam Girl. Super Girl, Squirrel Girl. Uh, a lot more distortion at the end, very typical of this album, just lots of points of huge distortion. And it ends with like the guitars doing this, like playing on these half notes. And I thought it was going somewhere. And then it stopped. So that was my stamp, okay? I'm gonna go through the rest of the album a little bit quicker. Next track is called Lips. 
all guitars here, so many layers of guitars, um, till there's like these weird like phaser gun sounds and some tickling sounds and I bite my lips, pucker up, I go to hell sometimes. I like that. I just like that lyric. I go to hell sometimes. <laughs> you know? I like hell is eternal damnation, right? I mean, I got Dante behind my shoulder right there. You see? You see Dante back there? Uh, you read the Inferno. You don't go to hell sometimes. Well, actually, I guess he went to hell sometimes. Hmm. Anyways, uh, crazy loud guitar at the ends, which I like though, because they're the same basic chords from the beginning. And just drum, the drums are great here. I suppose she's playing everything on this album. Uh, maybe there's some other guitars, but I think she's playing drums as well. And it's neat because um, <laughs> I'm going to sound like such an Xer and such a boomer, but it's really nice these days when these young musicians know how to play instruments uh, because it is, okay? Uh, next track is called Fling, which is cool because we're almost in hyper poppy area. These metallic sounds that just settle into this great groove with just a great drum line. Almost like a 1990s style four track recording style of guitar. Big chorus sounds. Uh, Tell me I'm good. I'm a good girl. All these themes really, really, really just this really feels like this is uh, so much of this album feels like it's from the position of a woman uh, who is in a relationship with a very controlling, manipulative, and potentially abusive man. It just feels like that. More this kind of like consumption, this cannibalistic love, the rapacious desire of... Anyways, he's just itching to get inside. It's all about being in his mouth. Anyways, But it's got a great groove. <laughs> Holding a leech. Uh, has this great distortion loop, guitar lines, and gentle drums... Um, the lyrics of the second part are just really even more grungy. I don't know. Am I crazy? Am I crazy for this grunge comparison? I know what most of you are going to be saying. Sky, it's really just shoegaze. It's just dream poppy shoegaze. I don't know why you're talking like that, but there you go. I just, I feel like it's more. More disfigurement lyrics, you know, maim me and wait till I'm sick on the floor and that kind of just sort of gross world that we're here. Backseat Girl, very cool drum line to start again. No, all right. <laughs> to be fair, to be fair to you who I just made fun of, this is basically just a, a stupid plant. You know, I'm not a stupid plant. I love you. I love you, Perry. Um, I'm going to move over a little bit so I stop hitting Perry in case my wife ever watches this video. I know she loves me more than she loves Perry, but she'd prefer to have both. Um, this is just a shoegaze song. Great doubled voice. The drums are so good. And then she even does some like vocal gymnastics. In general, her voice is very restrained, which makes sense for the kind of music that she's making. She's not trying to make like fantastic pop. She's not trying to go on Mariah Carey style runs. But she's capable of doing it. Uh, some epic bits here. It's kind of grinding noise. I will say that in general, the lyrics had, were lost on me. I had to read the lyrics, which maybe, you know, that's a hallmark of grunge. That's a hallmark of, 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 uh, of shoegaze music. It's just a general hallmark of a lot of different kinds of music. Uh, this is where uh, she sings, quit wasting your time looking for somebody else when she's right there. Boy, when I'm gone, you'll think about me all the time. I know keys locked in the car, pictures of David Ortiz on the wall. And I came home to watch my husband play. Now I'm playing a dangerous game. If you don't know, that's David Ortiz, number 34 on the Boston Red Sox. Okay? He's like one of my heroes right here. So, I don't know why there's a picture of David Ortiz. Not his real name. I don't know why there's a picture of David Ortiz <laughs> on the wall in this image. I can't quite tell what's happening here. Except that it just sort of feels, again... It feels like this back seat is sort of like a back seat girl, like a girl who's mostly useful in the back seat of a car, presumably with sexual favors. Uh, good luck trying to catch me if you're still going to talk to me like I'm 17, and I know you fuck me like you want me. Left cuts on the side of your face with the rest of me. I don't know. This is really unpleasant. If if like if I if if I were like related to Jane Remover, I'd be like Jane. 
whatever, whatever kind of whatever kind of people you're hooking up with, you should take a break. <laughs> this is it is bleak. <laughs> you know, remember what I was talking about? The dark source of light. I could really imagine if I were younger and I was involved in a lot of sort of modern style uh, relationships, and especially yeah, sort of like you know, kind of like kinky, you know, just sort of like stylish. I could imagine this album being very therapeutic. Uh, idling somewhere, kind of low, almost techno-y sounds, cool, more... <laughs> it's kind of like, reminds me a little bit of the band Hum from the 90s, which, whoa, you've probably never heard of Hum. They're a pretty good band out of uh, Champaign, uh, Illinois. And she's out of Chicago, right? Isn't that right? She's out of Chicago? That was my joke earlier. I don't think that Bandcamp thinks that she sounds like the band Chicago. I think she's from Chicago. Um... But also, this is my least favorite track on the album. I think it's because it sort of reminds me of new metal as well. So just be careful, you know? You don't want to go that 90s. Um, very, again, these sort of nonsensically coherent lyrics. I had a dream, all my teeth fell out sleeping next to you. I had a dream, all my hair fell out sitting next to, sleeping next to you. I had a dream, I sunk into your bed, trails left behind, I'm covered in him and scared. This is all it'll be. You play Jane, she stares real hard at the hole in your mouth. She sings along and you don't even know who's the song about. So like, is she talking to herself? You play Jane, is she talking about Jane being the fake person? Is Jane the real person? Uh, it's very complicated. This is where I would prefer not to do, even try to draw any conclusions. It's a very musically impressive outro though. This, for some reason, the outro at the end of the song is like a level up in terms of its musical complexity. Always have and always will. Contains one of my favorite lyrics. Drunk like a pop star, hung like a model. Don't know really what it means, but uh, it's a good line. <laughs> kind of droning tones, a chorus on the voice, that kind of ethereal feeling. She has sort of an endearingly whiny voice here. Um, this is where the lyrics are the most clear on the entire album, which is good and bad. I really like the way that she describes this, though. She, did, she talks about... So, um, if you have big feelings, right? like I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big feeling guy. Right? I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just passionate about everything. I'm very rarely neutral on much. Like Lady Gaga, that's like it. That's basically the only thing I'm like neutral on, you know, because I really appreciate her as an artist, but I don't particularly like listening to her music, so I'm kind of neutral. So Lady Gaga, and that's about it, right? Um, but what's interesting here is <laughs> she sings, I envy how big your feelings are, how much you hate your life. <laughs> so, you know, that's the negative side to having really big feelings because you can have really big feelings towards hating your own life. Pudding. Running like a lamb with her legs cut off, I'll act like mine's not on the line. Wow. Whoa. Just, what happened? What happened in that? What happened? <laughs> how did we go from I love how much you hate your life to running like a lamb with her legs cut off? This is like a cadaver-like ski. This is like, like, this is like she just wrote down lyrics to five different songs and then mixed them up together. I'm sure there's a sense to it. I can't quite figure it out except to say it paints a sort of uncomfortable feeling, an anxious tension. The image of a lamb with its legs cut off is very unpleasant. Full blast of a guitar here and all this, like, this really is, again, kind of shoegazy. I, I apologize for making fun of you so bad. Because uh, this really does have that, that wall of sound feeling. Uh, a quiet part, and then another screaming bit. Kind of an odd ending. Then we get to the title track, Census Designated. It is interesting. The title itself, I assumed, had something to do with one's identity being indicated on the census as being some kind of official re recognition of who you really are versus who your birth certificate said you are, okay? Because a lot of people have birth certificates that are wrong, right? It's far out, right? That's, it's cool, you know, that we now can understand that people had birth certificates and there was a, a letter, M or F, and it was wrong. You goofed. You, know, you didn't know. You don't know. You know, you don't know. You know, you know. We shouldn't stop until they don't do that anymore, right? We should have a blank. I don't know. Anyways, 
Maybe there's doctors. Tell me why that's not a good idea. Uh, point is, that's what I thought the census designated means. I don't know. The video, uh, if you haven't seen it, is by Quadica. It's great because it's very Quadica style. It reminds me a lot of the, sorry, I meant to, I didn't mean to haunt you, um, which if you haven't been following the lore of Professor Sky um, in my, the last like couple months of my father's life, he really connected to that album in a way that he has never connected to anything that I've ever played for him ever. And we watched that entire video together. And it's a very, very warm memory in my life. And it's one of the top two or three things I'm most thankful for with this channel. Um, so even just seeing <laughs> Quatica directing somebody else put me in that emotional place. So I'm not a neutral bystander here. But the sort of travelogue style, the changing cameras, there's a beautiful part where she's playing baseball. Um, just the imagery, you know, the imagery of sort of being in middle America and being a, whatever, 19, 20 year old trans woman playing baseball. Uh, it's a, a great image. She's also drinking wine and she's underage. So not cool. Not cool. I don't support underage drinking. That's okay. Uh, this song's a little more like emo pop than the rest. And actually the guitar reminded me a lot of The Cure. I wonder if that's not a direct influence on here. Um, kind of simple two chords here. And this is the song. This is the song that Jane Remover got on to Lyric Genius to say, knock it off, okay? That's, that's what I say when I get really mad. I say, knock it, knock it off, the Boston accent. Because people were saying this song, this is what she said. Can you all please stop making annotations regarding getting groomed slash sexual abuse? The song is not about that at all. The song is about... Is, uh, the song is not entirely from my perspective as well. It is telling when the song is about the music industry, but people gravitate towards more inappropriate and triggering topics. Unless I state otherwise, stop annotating on my songs. If you're unsure what the lines are about, please stop making assumptions. Stop making videos, Professor Sky. Gosh. Uh, and so this is interesting because I get it. You could totally read these lyrics as being about being groomed because there's these, you know, I'm barely legal is one of the lines, earn money like a man. But it's way more clear that it's about life in the music industry, <clears throat> about being fucked by the music industry, by figures in it. But it also works. I mean, I, I think she's sort of having her cake and eating it too because I think she's doing an interesting thing. It seems to me that it's either an amazing coincidence or a very intentional parallel of showing the way that music industry practices take advantage of young people uh, and the vulnerable and the exploitable in a way similar to the way that groomers do. But it actually reminds me, um, you may know, I'm a big fan of the Smiths. Uh, so that's, that's my wall. That's uh, every single Smiths poster uh, ever made. So that's uh, how big of a Smiths fan I am. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Morrissey's current political situation, but what are you going to do? Uh, but they have a song called This Charming Man, and it's very hard not to read that song as being about a, a young man who is groomed by an older man. The lyrics are just like, you know, about a man like having a bicycle breakdown and a, a man in a, in a nice car picks him up and says how handsome he is. And, and it feels like a very sort of coming of age story about an older man and a potentially underage, man, uh, underage boy in a sexual relationship. That's just the easiest way to read the song. <laughs> but there's a, see, there's a look it up on YouTube uh, where Marcy and uh, Johnny Marr play the song for a bunch of school kids in England. <laughs> they have the kids singing along with it. And then at the end, Marcy's like, this is a song about being charming uh, because very few people are charming these days and I think it's important that we sing about being charming. So it feels a little bit the same way, you know? Like that's Marcy directly telling us this charming man is not about that. It's about being charming. Cool gribbly bits on the outro, uh, explosiveness there. This is, the interesting about this album, so, you know, this is my record player back here. I have a Bluetooth receiver, so I sometimes play the music that I'm reviewing on these speakers. It's not as good of a speaker album as it is a headphone album. As a headphone album, it really works with all the layers, and when it gets really loud, it doesn't kind of fill up the house in sort of a disturbing way. So 
I will say that. The like video starts off with like over a minute of what sounds like video feedback and then some nice soft chorus guitars come in. The singing is very high and sweet. Uh, this is maybe her best vocal performance on the album. It gets hard and grungy with a great guitar lead line. Um, <laughs> Why have a seat at the table if I'm sticking around to watch you eat? I almost forgot what I looked like till I saw you playing with yourself online and in your hand, I know you're dying to see me again. Oh, do you see me in the video? So according to her, this is a song about uh, running towards the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's the story of a guy and a girl. The girl's watching a guy play with himself online and she tries to track him down and look him up for real life, but when they, but when they meet, he ends up taking advantage of her. So. Remember I said the of the moment thing, okay? So like, I've already expressed to you that I don't understand like OnlyFans or I don't understand, uh, what's that thing? Uh, internet comment etiquette always does. Chat roulette? <laughs> Is that the one where there's always the dudes just yanking it? Uh, so I mean, like, I, like, I have only, you know, secondhand, thirdhand uh, understanding of that kind of stuff. So, but... There should be there should be music about this, right? I mean, there's what there's probably right now there's like more than a thousand men uh, masturbating on camera, that, like broadcast to virtually everybody. That's new. <laughs> that, isn't, that wasn't happening 15 years ago, 20 years ago. You know, you go back 15, 20, 25 years. I, it wasn't happening. So. Why not sing about it? And it's interesting, you know, this idea that like, a, like, because that's the other thing is you always assume, or at least you're told. I've never heard a woman or a girl ever tell me ever even once in their entire life, who boy, do I love it when I have unsolicited pictures of male genitalia or unsolicited videos of male genitalia. So this is kind of taking that from another angle. And then the idea of it being light at the end of the tunnel. So she, it's like a weird love story. And she's actually a lot like Marcy, now that I think about it. Her lyrics, because Marcy will often write those kinds of lyrics about a sort of a sort of pathetic, lovelorn character who's looking for something that is kind of pathetic. I'm just riffing right now. It's just, anyways. So, it, interesting, you know? I, uh... <laughs> So I was at this conference and, and I was basically explaining to a bunch of people who study 17th century French literature how to use rap music <clears throat> to teach. And so they're all sort of like telling me how old they feel by watching my videos. I'm like, well, I feel old by making my videos. Uh, that's what's part of the thing, you know? I mean, I wouldn't be thinking about this kind of activity if I wasn't thinking about this kind of music. So thank you. Contingency songs, a uh, very kind of nice outro. It's that winding down feeling. It's the last track on the album. Then there's the lyric, I'm afraid I've only changed myself because you are not into the original. I have an angel on my shoulder that says, careful, Sky, because um, talking about recently transitioning and then saying that you are afraid of um, the uh, wiseness or you're, you're questioning your decision to have transitioned <clears throat> is like, like that, that's not what this lyric is about. Like that's not what this song is about. But even having that in there, and I don't know because obviously I'm not trans, but because trans people are so marginalized and because they're, very rarely believed, okay? Like very, very rarely believed. Like infinitesimally believed. Like like one out of a million people believe that they exist. Okay, like it's terrible. And I know if you're out there and you're a cishet whatever, you think like, why do I have to say cis? Just deal with it, okay? Just infinitesimally the amount that you are recognized for being who you are, you know? So that I think because of that, you, you can't transmit or express doubt at all. But there must be, for some people, some amount of doubt. I mean, that's just natural. I mean, we all, you know, if I, I have at times, when I was younger, questioned my sexuality, I guess depending on what it means to have been attracted to Bugs Bunny as a woman, questioned my gender or something, it's stuff, right? Like, these questions pop up. 
and I, I think I have answers. But to me to question, to me to put forth that question doesn't endanger my very existence. So I read this as a line that hints at that. But I don't know what I'm talking about. So if I'm wrong, please correct me. Okay? Uh, do you feel young again when you are on top of me? <laughs> This is a lyric which would fit perfectly on the Lauren Orday album. Um, I forget the name of the track, and she's not helping me. Oh, wait, I think it was Equus. Yes, I think it was Equus. It had a very sort of similar lyric. And um, I think this is an interesting thing where a lot of young people who are in sexual relationships with older people uh, feel like they are um, being exploited and uh, like having their life essence <laughs> having their sexual adrenochrome drained from them by these old vampires haunted bicycle okay um <laughs> these are my patreons uh they help me buy music like the lauren Arday album or Audaire. uh we are in talks of doing an interview by the way uh, Lauren and I, so hopefully that'll be coming up for the end of the year. Might do sort of like an end of the year, best of kind of interview. I don't know. So I'll finally figure out how to pronounce her name. Uh, and so thank you to them because they helped me to buy music, which is like super wicked awesome. Please uh, subscribe, leave an AVAA, and uh, there's the camera. <laughs>